This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Allison Hester of Athens, Georgia. My Doggy and I by Robert Ballantyne. Chapter 1 Explains Itself I possess a doggy, not a dog, observe, but a doggy. If he had been a dog, I would not have presumed to intrude him on your notice. A dog is all very well in his way, one of the noblest of animals, I admit, and preeminently fitted to be the companion of man, for he has an affectionate nature, which man demands, and a forgiving disposition, which man needs but a dog with all his noble qualities is not to be compared to a doggy my doggy is unquestionably the most charming and in every way delightful doggy that was ever born my sister has a baby about which she raves in somewhat similar terms but of course that is ridiculous for her baby differs in no particular form from ordinary babies except perhaps in the matter of violent weeping of which it is fond whereas my doggy is unique a perfectly beautiful and singular specimen of of well i won't say what because my friends usually laugh at me when i say it and i don't like to be laughed at freely admit that you don't at once perceive the finer qualities either mental or physical of my doggy partly owing to the circumstance that he is shapeless and hairy the former quality is not prepossessing while the latter tends to veil the amiable expression of his countenance and the luster of his speaking eyes. But as you come to know him, he grows upon you. Your feelings are touched, your affections stirred, and your love is finally evoked. As he resembles a doormat, or rather a scrap of very ragged doormat, and has an amiable spirit, I have called him Dumps. I should not be surprised if you did not perceive any connection here. You are not the first one who has failed to see it. I never saw it myself. When I first met Dumps, he was scurrying towards me along a sequestered country lane. It was in the dog days. Dust lay thick on the road. The creature's legs were remarkably short, though active, and his hair being long, he swept up the dust in clouds as he ran. He was yelping and I observed that one or two stones appeared to be racing with, or after him. The voice of an angry man also seemed to chase him, but the owner of the voice was at that moment concealed by a turn in the lane, which was bordered by high stone walls. Hydrophobia, of course, flashed into my mind. I grasped my stick and drew close to the wall. The hairy whirlwind, if I may so call it, came wildly on, but instead of passing me or snapping at my legs as I had expected, it stopped and crawled towards me in a piteous, supplicating manner that at once disarmed me. If the creature had lain still, I should have been unable to distinguish its head from its tail, but as one end of him whined and the other wagged, I had no difficulty. Stooping down with caution, I patted the end that whined, whereupon the end that wagged became violently demonstrative. Just then, the owner of the voice came round the corner. He was a big, rough fellow, in ragged garments, and armed with a thick stick, which he seemed about to fling at the little dog, when I checked him with a shout. "'You better not, my man, unless you want your own head broken.' You see, I am a pretty well-sized man myself, and, as I felt confidence in my strength, my stick, and the goodness of my cause, I was bold. "'What do you mean by ill-treating the little dog?' I demanded sternly as I stepped up to the man. "'A cove may do as he likes with his own, mayn't he?' answered the man with a sulky scowl. "'A cove may do nothing of the sort.' I said indignantly, for cruelty to dumb animals always has the effect of inclining me to fight, though I am naturally of a peaceable disposition. There is an act of parliament, I continued, which goes by the honored name of Martin, and if you venture to infringe that act, I'll have you taken up and prosecuted. 
while i was speaking i observed a peculiar leer on the man's face which i could not account for he appeared however to have been affected by my threats for he ceased to scowl and assumed a differential air as he replied well sir it do seem rather odd that a cove should be blowed up for kindness kindness i exclaimed in surprise ay kindness sir that there animal loves me it do like a brother and the love is mutual we've lived together now off and on for the matter of six months well i gets employment in a factory about fifteen miles from here in which no dogs is allowed in course i can't throw up my situation sir can i neither can my doggy give up his master what he's so fond of so i'm obliged to leave him in charge of a friend with strict orders to keep him locked up till i'm fairly gone well off i goes but he manages to escape and runs arter me now what can a feller do but drive em on with sticks and stones though it do go to my art to do it but if he goes to the factory he's sure to be shot or scragged or drownded or something so you see sir it's out of pure kindness i'm a pelting of him confess that i felt somewhat doubtful of the truth of his story but in order to prevent any expression of my face betraying me i stooped and patted the dog while the man spoke it received my attentions with evident delight a thought suddenly flashed on me will you sell your little dog i asked why sir he replied with some hesitation i don't quite like to do that he's such a pure breed and and he's so fond of me but have you not told me that you are obliged to part with him i thought the man looked puzzled for a moment but only for a moment turning to me with a bland smile he said ah sir ah that's just where it is i am obliged to part with him but i ain't obliged to sell him if i only part with him my friend keeps him for me and we may meet again but if i sell him he's gone for ever don't you see how's ever if you wants i'm weary bad i'll do it on one consideration and that is that you'll be good to him i began to think i had misjudged the man what's his name i asked again for one moment there was that strange puzzled look in the man's face but it passed and he turned with another of his bland smiles his name sir ah his name he ain't got no name sir no name i exclaimed in surprise no sir i object to giving dogs names on principle it's too much like treating them as if they was christians and you know they couldn't be christians if they wanted to ever so much besides whatever name you gives em there must be so many other dogs with the same name that you stand a chance of the wrong dog coming to you even you calls that's a strange reason how then do you call em to you why when i wants em i shout hi or hello or i whistles indeed said i somewhat amused by the humor of the fellow and what do you ask for him five per ten and he's dirt cheap at that was the quick reply come come my man you know the dog's not worth that not worth it sir he replied with an injured look i tell you he's as cheap at that look at his breeding and then think of his affectionate nature is the affections to count for nothing admitted that the affections were worth money though it was generally understood that they could not be purchased but still objected to the price until the man said in a confidential tone well come sir since you do express such a deal of love for him and promise to be good to him i'll make a sacrifice and let you have him for three pun ten come gave in and walked off with my purchase leaping joyfully at my heels the man chuckled a good deal after receiving the money but i took no notice of that at the time though i thought a good deal about it afterwards ah little did i think as dumps and i walked home that day of the depth of the attachment that was to spring up between us 
the varied experiences of life we were destined to have together and the important influence he was to exercise on my career forgot to mention that my name is mellon john mellon dumps knows my name as well as he knows his own on reaching home dumps displayed an evidence of good breeding which convinced me that he could not have spent all of his puppyhood in company with the man from whom i had bought him he wiped his feet on the doormat with great vigor before entering my house and also refused to pass in until i led the way now dumps said i seating myself on the sofa in my solitary room i was a bachelor at the time a medical student just on the point of completing my course come here and let us have a talk to my surprise the doggie came promptly forward sat down on his hind legs and looked up into my face i was touched by this display of ready confidence a confiding nature has always been to me powerfully attractive whether in child cat or dog i brushed the shaggy hair from his face in order to see his eyes they were moist and intensely black so was the point of his nose you seem to be an affectionate doggy dumps a portion of hair scarce worthy the name of tail wagged as i spoke and he attempted to lick my fingers but i prevented this by patting his head i have an unconquerable aversion to licking perhaps having received more than the average allowance in another sense at school may account for my dislike to it even from a dog now dumps i continued you and i ought to be good friends i've bought you for a pretty large sum too let me tell you from a man who i'm quite sure treated you ill and i intend to show you what good treatment is but there are two things i mean to insist on and it is well that we should understand each other at the outset of our united korea you must never bark at my friends not even at my enemies when they come to see me and you must not beg at meals do you understand the way in which that shaggy creature cocked his ears and turned his head from side to side slowly and gazed with its lustrous eyes while i was speaking went far to convince me that it really did understand what i said of course it only wagged its rear tuft of hair in reply and whimpered slightly refer to its rear tuft advisedly because at a short distance my doggy when in repose resembled an elongated and shapeless mass but when roused by a call or otherwise three tufts of hair instantly sprang up two at one end and one at the other indicating his ears and tail it was only by these signs that i could ascertain at any time his exact position i was about to continue my remarks to dumps when the door opened and my landlady appeared bearing the dinner tray oh i beg potting sir she said drawing back i didn't hear your voice sir till the door was open and i thought you was alone but i can come back at come in mrs miff there's nobody here but my little dog one i've just bought a rather shaggy terrier what do you think of him uh, do we buy it sir inquired mrs miff in some anxiety as she passed round the table at a respectful distance from dumps i think not he seems an amiable creature said i patting his head do you ever buy dumps well sir i never feel quite easy rejoined mrs miff in a doubtful tone as she laid my cloth with as it were one eye ever on the alert you never know when these airy creatures gonna fly at you if you could see their eyes you might have a guess what they was thinking of and then it's so awkward not knowing which end of the airy bundle is the biting end you can't help being a little nervous having finished laying the cloth mrs miff backed out of the room after the manner of attendance on royalty overturning two chairs with her skirts as she went and showing her full front to the enemy but the enemy gave no sign good or bad all the tufts were down flat and he stood motionless while mrs miff retreated dumps what do you think of mrs miff the doggie ran to me at once and we engaged in a little further conversation until my landlady returned with the viands to my surprise 
dumps at once walked sedately to the hearth rug and lay down thereon with his chin on his paws at least i judged so from the attitude for i could see neither chin nor paws this act i regarded as another evidence of good breeding he was not a beggar and therefore could not have spent his childhood with the man from whom i had bought him i wish you could speak dumps said i laying down my knife and fork when about half finished and looking towards the hearth rug one end of him rose a little the other end wagged gently but as i made no further remark both ends subsided now dumps said i finishing my meal with a draught of water which is my favorite beverage you must not suppose that you've got a greedy master though i don't allow begging there sir is your corner where you shall always have the remnants of my dinner come the dog did not move until i said come then with a quick rush he made for the plate and very soon cleared it well you have been well trained said i regarding him with interest such conduct is neither the result of instinct nor accident and sure am i the more i think of it that the sulky fellow who sold you to me was not your tutor but as you can't speak i shall never find out your history so dumps i'll dismiss the subject saying this i sat down to the newspaper with which i invariably solaced myself for half an hour after dinner before going out on my afternoon rounds this was the manner in which my doggy and i began our acquaintance and i have been thus particular in recounting the details because they bear in a special manner on some of the most important events of my life being as already mentioned a medical student and having almost completed my course of study i had undertaken to visit in one of the poorest districts in london in the neighbourhood of whitechapel partly for the purpose of gaining experience in my profession and partly for the sake of carrying the word of life the knowledge of the saviour into some of the many homes where moral as well as physical disease is rife leanings and inclinations are inherited not less than bodily peculiarities my father had a particular tenderness for poor old women of the lowest class so have i when i see a bowed aged wrinkled white-haired feeble woman in rags and dirt a gush of tender pity almost irresistibly inclines me to go and pat her head sit down beside her comfort her and give her money it matters not where her antecedents may have been worthy or unworthy there she stands now with age helplessness and a hopeless temporal future pleading more eloquently in her behalf than could the tongue of man or angel true the same plea is equally applicable to poor old men but reader i write not at the present of principles so much as of feelings my weakness is old women accordingly on my professional visiting list i had at that time a considerable number of these one of them who was uncommonly small usually miserable and pathetically feeble lay heavy on my spirit just then she had a remarkably bad cold at the time which betrayed itself chiefly in a frequent but feasible sneeze as i rose to go out and looked at my doggy who was or seemed to be asleep on the rug a sudden thought occurred to me that poor old creature i muttered is very lonely in her garret a little dog might comfort her perhaps but no dumps you are too lively for her too bouncing she would require something feeble and affectionate like herself come i'll think of that so my doggy you shall keep watch here till i return End of chapter one